welcome this morning to Life of Faith. And uh, my beautiful wife, Jennifer, what do you have to share with us today? Well, I can't get away from the word understanding, so that's what's today. <laughs> Again, um, I want to take you to Ephesians 4, and I'm going to read 17 through 18. And it reads this in the, in the New King James. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. In other words, the non-believers. And... Um, as they walk in the futility of their mind. Futility, in other words, they're, the, they're trying to figure out everything on their own. They're trying to figure out, you know, the answers to everything. And, you know, and, the, and, and it's just, ne it never works. It never works. And reading on into 18, it says, having their understanding darkened, being enlightened from the life of God. That is how important it is for you to truly understand what the Word of God is saying to you. Mm -hmm. Because like the Gentiles, it says that they're alienated from the life of God. But you as a born-again believer, you're never alienated from God. But you can alienate yourself from the life right. that God has for you. When you are like Gentiles, people that don't believe in God, when you try to figure out everything on your own. Because he said, he said in his word that he's given you his mind. You've been given the mind of Christ. Amen. So just use, use it. <laughs> he has the answers to everything. And uh, going on it says, because of the ignorance that's in them, I'm sorry, because of the ignorance in them, because of the blindness of their hearts. In, it, in, in another version it reads, it darkens the heart. When you are trying to figure out everything on your own, it darkens the heart a little more because you don't know and, you, and you're leaning into your own understanding and, and trust, eventually trust goes away mm -hmm. because you're trusting in you. So lean, lean on what the word says because yes. it is the truth forever and ever and ever so amen. amen all right living the changed life not how to change your life but living the changed life can you say that living the changed life what's it look like jeff you'll be excited i know you're taking your shoes and everything off but i got my running shoes on today you're right you're right by if, if i start you're right behind me Okay. All righty. I'm just saying. And thanks for pointing that out, guy. Yesterday at prayer, like we're in the middle of it. We're right in the middle of, of talking about what God is showing us. And I get a text right in the middle as I'm listening to what somebody, and I looked at it and, and it said, it's from my wife. Look at your shoes. And I looked and I had two different shoes on. <laughs> But the good thing about it is I had another pair just like it at home. <laughs> so, anyway, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. I don't care what kind of shoes they're wearing or if they're mismatched or not. Amen? <laughs> so, praise God. Anyway, thank God for a wonderful wife that helps me, helps me, helps me get dressed. It's amazing that I'm able to put on... Yeah, apparently not. See what happens when she doesn't help me. <laughs> Living the changed life. Jesus came so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. But that's not just a theory. That's not just mystical. That's not just a doctrine that we hope to get there one day. It's for us to enjoy life here on the earth right now and his life through us. And I want you to pay really close attention this morning. Um, don't be thinking about the food. It'll still be there. Let's think about our spiritual food this morning because the Lord's really given me some things uh, to share with you that, I, that just is foundational. You're going to hear the gospel this morning, the good news 
of Jesus Christ. But I'm telling you, you're going, uh, you, there's an understanding that I believe. Remember, we talk about get understanding, what Jennifer was talking about. You're going to hear the truth of the gospel that maybe some of you haven't realized before. So, um, so pay close attention. I ended last week with Galatians chapter 2. And in verse 16... Paul said this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm reading out of the King James Version. Somebody says, why? Well, it's what I grew up with. And so I'm just used to it, and I know it's not uh, modern, but there's some things that you, that you do get sometimes from the King James Version that you will not get from modern translations. And here's one of those things. It says that I am not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of, not faith in, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. In other words, I'm justified by His faith. Now, what does that mean? It goes on to say, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. All right, so, so now we believe in him, and it says that we might be justified by the faith of him. So my faith in him releases the faith of him to work in my life. And I want to talk about that a little bit more today because I don't mean it to be confusing, but it is that I don't have to have faith for things and I don't have to have faith for something or just faith in him to do something. It is actually if I have faith in him and what he did, then all of a sudden his life starts living through me. And guys, if it... it if it were possible for Jesus to truly live through me and to, and to be uh, um, manifested in every area of my life and to be effective and, and, that, and, all, and that every area is touched by him, that's what I want. I'd rather him to touch every area of my life than me to touch every area of my life. See? And so he goes on down here in, in verse, let's see here, in verse 20, he says, So I am... I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live, here it is again, by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Praise God. Now, I want to talk through this a little bit. What does that mean that the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God? So, in the Garden of Eden, you know, and, and, and uh, let, me, let, me, let me just, let me take a rabbit trail for a second. I know, we got to eat, so I'll do this as quick as I can. It's a, it's a, short, a short hop here. Um, and I, let me just say it this way. I, I, I saw somebody, a um, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty well-known preacher, say that we need to disconnect or we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. That we need to, that, that, that if, if you believe that creation and all of that is a myth and that you believe in, in, in evolution and, and all that, then the best thing for you to do is not even think about the Old Testament but you just need to, you know, just, just, just focus on the resurrection, you know. And, 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 and his intent is to, is, to, is to try to get beyond people's intellect and try to get them just to focus on Jesus, you know, and that sort of thing. And so I have no problem with getting people to focus on Jesus. But remember, the things that we've talked about, you've got to come to a place in your life that this, that this right here is the inspired word of God. Jesus said that truth, that your word is truth. Now, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus himself, if you're going to believe in Jesus, 
If you believe, and, and all, I mean, let's get outside of the word for a minute. There's, there's historical evidence. Everything is there that Jesus existed. You even look at people like Josephus, a Jewish historian, and all of that. Everybody knows that, that, that he existed and his ministry was there. So if you come to the place that you say, I'm going to believe in Jesus, and that you believe that he's the Savior of the world, then you better, you better believe in what he has to say. And he even said, in the beginning, God made them, you know, male and female. And in the beginning was Adam and Eve and in the beginning and all of this because he was basing it on the word of God. He is the living word. Your life has to be governed by the word of God. Everything that we see was created by the word. And so if you want to be free from sin, if you want to be free from uh, uh, from depression and oppression and addiction and addiction, addiction and addiction. I mean, if you want to if you want to experience the real life life. And I'm going to tell you guys, not just from the word, but I'm going to tell you from my own experience, God is real. God is good. God loves you. Jennifer and I have discovered more of him in the last seven years than at any other point in our life. And our lives have, have continued to increase and increase and increase in Him. And we get to know Him more and experience Him more. God continues to do things for us. There was a time that, I, I, that God felt distant. There was a time that I had questions. There was a time that I have doubt, uh, that I had doubt. And I think everybody goes through doubt and questions and, and things at some point in their life. Is God real? Is God there? But I'm telling you, the answers are not found outside of the Word of God. You, the answers are not found in this natural environment because Jesus is a spirit. And there is an aching in the human heart that is looking for answers, that wants, that, that wants to see good things come to them, that knows that there is more. That's the reason why people go after, you know, the, just different religions or mystical things or is looking for, because they know that what they're getting from science and what they're getting from education and what they're getting from this natural world, it's not filling the need. It's not filling the void. Because you were made to be in union with God, not with philosophy, not with education, not with the media, not with a political uh, persuasion, not with one group, not with another group. Your identity is in your sonship and being a child of God. And only Jesus, only Jesus can come in and fill the need that your heart longs for. He says, I've come, the Spirit of the Lord is on me to heal the brokenhearted. Amen. And I just want to encourage you, if you question and have doubts, go to Him, call on Him, Jesus. Reveal yourself to me. He's looking for that opportunity. And so we don't unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament from the, from, because it is the story of man. It is, it is our story. It's our it's our history. It's, 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 it's God Him from the very beginning created man. And yes, He did it in seven days. He did. And, 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 and science is continuing to start to back that up. But, even, but none of that matters because I don't try to use science to prove the Word. I, I stand on the Word of God. The Word of God is forever settled in heaven. I've been talking about having your life governed by the word. This is the change. This is living the changed life. He created man and, and, and gave man dominion. And then man messed up. I'm not going to go read it, but if you'll look at Genesis chapter 3, the Bible tells us that, as, that, that God has said, if you eat of the, uh, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and see, they only knew good. Get this. In the Garden of Eden, they only knew good. Perfect, holy, righteous, walked with God in the cool of the day. Everything is awesome. Sounds like a song I watched on the Lego movie. Everything is awesome. They're enjoying that. And then they decided, well, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more. Satan came in, gave them the thought, well, God's withholding from you. And so what they did is they said, well, let's just check this out. I want to be like God. They didn't realize they already were because they were created in His image. 
And so they reached for something more. And in the day that they ate of it, God said, you'll surely die. And what happened is they did. They died spiritually. Humanity died spiritually. Now, what does spiritual death mean? And I want to kind of explain this for a moment. Spiritual death is not that your spirit ceases to exist. It does not mean... Because, see, when God created Adam and Eve... Well, I'm just going to tell you right now, this is going to be part one, okay? Because this, is, this series is so important that you get this foundation, okay? So that you can't be removed from it. When God created Adam, formed him out of the dust of the ground, the Bible says that he, he breathed into him. He breathed of his own nature into Adam and... He became a living soul. He became a three-part being. He became spirit, soul, and body. Now, when he died, he didn't die physically because God said in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. But he didn't die physically. He lived another 900 and some odd years. So what was God talking about? He was talking about spiritual death. And what that simply means is there was a separation, sin entered in. Turn with me over to Romans chapter 5 so that you see this. Thank you, Father. Romans chapter 5. So it tells us that in verse 12, Romans chapter 5, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We were born into sin. We were born into sin became the dominant force in our lives. We were slaves to it. We couldn't stop from it. It was designed to destroy our lives. Satan comes but to the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and sin, when it's finished, wants to produce death in some area of your life. Now, spiritual death isn't that your, your spirit ceased to exist. It's that life in your spirit only comes from one place, God. Your spirit is alive only if it is connected to the source of life, and that is God himself, see? He had that God component in him, but then all of a sudden he separated himself. Remember how Jennifer was talking about how Gentiles, unbelievers, through their understanding, their, their mind was darkened, they're alienated, alienated from the life of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, you're separated from the life of God. That is spiritual death. So, so Adam and Eve and humanity, when you're born, you have a spirit, it's just that spirit is the spirit of man. Yeah, this, it, it's just your spirit that is there that just is not connected to the life of God. So your spirit, your soul, and your body. Okay? Now, for God to be able to fix the situation, he had to come in the flesh because he had given authority over man so that he could fix the spiritual condition of man. He didn't come to fix your physical condition. He didn't come to fix your soulless condition. I mean, he'll heal, he'll do all of those things, and your soul is that, that part that's your character, that's unique about you, that's, that's your mind, your will, your emotions. He, he came to fix all that, but he came to deal with the root problem. This is the reason why the law couldn't work. This is the reason why, see, the law that says don't steal, don't kill, don't, you know, commit adultery, don't do this, don't do that. The law, the, the commandments, there's nothing wrong with those commandments. How many of us agree that we should never lie? How many of us have ever lied in our lives? So what's the problem? Is, is the law the problem? You're the problem. That's the whole, that's the, the law was perfect, just, and holy. We weren't. And so for us to be able to, to, to live the life that God wanted us to live and to experience the life that God wanted us to experience, he had to come and fix what was wrong with us, and that was our dead spirit. Now, in, 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 in first, uh, 2 Corinthians, I believe it is, let me see. No, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 
Turn with me to, to verse uh, 45. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. Look at this. This is an amazing passage of Scripture right here. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. I'm just waiting for it to come up on the screen. Hallelujah. Here, here's something that is stated about Jesus that I think is amazing. As and so it is written, the first man, Adam, talking about the first Adam, was made a living soul. This is when God breathed into him. The last Adam was made a quickening or life-giving spirit. What does that mean? The last Adam, that's Jesus. Jesus is called the last Adam. Now, this is so important that we get this. So, if he's the last Adam, get a hold of this. Jesus, when he showed up on the earth, was just like Adam the first time before he sinned. He was sinless. He was spotless. He was righteous. He was holy. I mean, he was God in the flesh. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. And so John the Baptist, when he saw him, said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so there was something about him. I mean, this is the most amazing thing. He could not die. Jesus, when he was here on the earth, could not die. Death did not have dominion over him. Amen. He walked, when he walked, when he, when he entered into the realm where death was, when he walked up to the leper, that deadly disease that was killing this man, that man said, I know I'm contagious, and so I know you can heal me. And Jesus said, well, yeah, I will. And he reached out and he touched that contagious man. Why? Because what was in the man, death, could not enter into where life is. Life removes death every single time. Light removes darkness every single time. See, sometimes we as believers, we shrink back. You know, we were ministering to somebody last night. She says, I, I don't want you to touch me because, you know, I don't want, you know, what's, what's on me to get on you. I said, I ain't worried about that. Come here. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Why? Because, listen, you've got, to, you've got to believe this in your heart. You've got to get this on the inside of you and know that the life of God now on the inside of you is greater than anything that is out in the world. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. Look at this. I mean... Uh, I'm just going to read this scripture. You don't have to bring it up. Hebrews 4.15, he, uh, we don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was, in, he was in all points tempted like we are yet without sins. Yet without sin. He lived a perfect, holy, just life. Death could not and did not have dominion on him. Think about it this. He was life walking in a fallen world. Jesus was life. And the life that was in him, John chapter 1 says, is the light of men. But every, and he says, I've come. I've come. This is the reason I've come. Listen to me. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's why I'm here. Now let me show you what that looks like. And he walked around, and he healed the sick, and he, he, he raised the dead, and, every, and cast out devils, and caused people to be set free, and healed people's hearts, and forgave sin. And everything that happened was life. Life. The kingdom was operating with him. Hallelujah. Think about it this way. He's the creator, because that says all things were made by him. Walking in his creation, the creation cannot kill the creator. The creation doesn't have authority over the creator. See, really, if you want to get down to it, man did not kill Jesus. You can blame, you can blame the Jews and you can blame the Romans and you can do whatever, but the creation cannot kill the creator. They tried, through his ministry, they tried to kill him. Tried to throw him off a cliff. 
tried to look for opportunities to kill him time, 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 and time again. And every time he just... Why? Death, death has no authority over him. See, check this out. Look at this. Verse, John chapter 10, verse 17. He was the king manifesting the kingdom of life. Jesus said this, Therefore does my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man takes it from me. No man. The high priest may have thought that he was responsible. Pilate may have thought that he was responsible. But no man could take life from Jesus Christ because he is life. But I lay it down of myself, of my own will. I have... I mean, think about a man that, that has this kind of power and this authority. He says, I've got power. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority and the power to take it up again. We don't, we're not joined to some mamby-pamby Jesus that's got a sheep around his shoulder that's just kind of walking through the tulips. Or anything? No, we've got the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one that's full of the Holy Ghost and power. He reigns, he lives, and they that receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will rule and reign in life through him who rules and reigns through us, Jesus Christ. Man, this commandment, he said, I've received of my Father. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. I wrote all of this down so that I would just kind of stay on task today. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. This is Peter on the day of Pentecost, first gospel message that was preached after they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Him, he's talking about Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God. In other words, the Bible says that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. This is the plan of redemption. You have taken and by wicked hands you've crucified, you've slain. But look at verse 24. It says this, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not Possible that he could be holding of it. Not possible. Not possible that he could stay in that grave. Not possible that death could keep him down. Not possible because he is the author and the prince of life. Not possible. Hallelujah. So here's what I want to do for a few minutes. I want to turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. We don't unhitch ourselves from the old covenant because it so beautifully has prophesied and foretold what Jesus would do and we have understanding as a result of it. And, and I want you to get that what happened on the cross and what Jesus went through, listen, in one moment, in that three-day moment, the history of humanity was represented. You and I, my life, your life, Adam's life, everybody that had lived 4,000 years up to that point, his life was represented in the one event that took place on the cross. This perfect, sinless man, joined together, one with God, decided that what I'm going to do is I am going to willingly lay down my life, willingly receive sin into myself, willingly take the same path that humanity did, but I'm not going to do it by sinning. I'm going to do it by accepting their sin into whew, their trespasses, everything that you did that was wrong, that he said, I'm willing to be the sacrifice for that. I'm willing to accept that. I'm willing to accept sin into, into me so that they can become the righteousness of God. He became you so that you could become him. 
He became you so that you could become Him. Isaiah 53, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I'm going to just tell you, you've got to believe. Next week, because I'm not going to have time today, but next week we are going to really get into this thing about the heart. What it means to let the kingdom of heaven and all of this reality to operate into your life. And really kind of bring this thing about living the changed life, what that means. I mean, uh, you don't want to miss it, okay? Who's believed our report? Who, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. This is talking about Jesus. Can you imagine this was all written hundreds of years before Jesus ever came on the scene? As a root out of the dry ground... He has no form nor comeliness, and we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. So all those songs that talk about how beautiful he is, it's wrong. <laughs> Maybe in the spirit realm he's beautiful. Maybe he's beautiful to us because of what he did. But when he was here on the earth, he wasn't the best looking guy in the world. He wasn't the one. People weren't going and saying, oh my gosh, have you seen him? He is so buff. He is so awesome looking. He, no, no, no. He, there was no beauty that we should desire him. He was very common looking and there was nothing that made him stand out besides the anointing of God, the love of God and the glory of God. What we don't need is we don't need preachers that are all into themselves and the way that they look. What we need is, is, is preachers that just want to manifest Jesus and his glory and let him, let him do what he does best. See? You know, don't get me started on that. So, um, when we shall see him, there's no beauty. Let's go to the next verse, because here's where it gets really interesting. He is despised. He is rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. We're talking about the cross here. We're talking about him being rejected. Everybody ran from him. Everybody, his disciples, hid their face from him. Everybody left him because he was there on the cross. Just think about it. Death could not overcome him while he walked on the earth. But the moment that in the garden he said, not my will, but your will be done. The last great temptation in Jesus' life was to, am I, going to, am I going to go after what my will is or am I going to go after what God's will and what the Father's will is in my life? And, he, and the Bible says that for the joy that was set before him, what he knew was coming, he endured the cross. Listen, there is a joy that is attached to the promises of God in your life. There is a plan for your life. There is a, a, he's got victory that is available for you. He wants you to experience his life, reigning in life. So, man, attack the situation. Go forward. Don't shrink back. Yesterday, in, during prayer, the Lord uh, was telling me, he said, don't, uh, man, this is, this is good. I wrote it down, and I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I believe this is for somebody this morning. So let me just, let me just bring this up real quick. Um, thank you, Lord. Here's what he said. It was a strong prayer yesterday morning. I heard, I heard, the, I heard the Spirit say, as so I just wrote this down in my notes, expand your capacity to believe. Expand your capacity to believe. Don't allow others, what they say about you, their opinion about you, what they're trying to do to you, don't allow others to cause you to shrink back or retreat in fear. Don't allow them, don't, don't allow them to say, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'm just, you know, I have a dream. I want to do something. I believe God's told me to do it. And people say, you can't do that. You don't have the education for it. You don't have the skill set for it. You, and so what do we do? We'll say, you know what, you're probably right. And so we'll just let those dreams just, just go. And we'll shrink back and, and, and just continue to work our nine to five job so that we're comfortable. And, you know, you don't really want to take too much risk. Right? You don't, you know, that's what people say. You don't want to take any risk. 
Don't take risk, you know, because you may lose it all. You may... Come on. We are called... Listen. That, that is a life of mediocrity. That is a life of average. That is a life that is simply trying to live the same kind of dream that everybody else in the rat race is trying to live. That is not what you're called to. You're a child of the king. You're a child of the kingdom. You are a child of the most high God, the creator of heaven and earth. And he says, if God be for me, who can be against me? And God said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And if God is, he said, I will bless boldly say, the Lord is my help. What shall I fear that man can be to me, uh, to, uh, can do to me? What that means is I, I am so confident in God with me. I am so confident in God in me. I am so confident in his life through me that it doesn't matter what happens. Doesn't matter if I make a mistake. Doesn't matter if I didn't get it right. Guess what? I got God right there, ready just to pick me up. Just like he did Peter when he was walking on the water. He, you know, Peter said, Lord, save me when he kind of looked around and got his eyes off of Jesus. Keep your eyes on him and you'll never fall. Glory to God. But even in that moment, Jesus didn't, you know, uh, 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 hold on to his hand and then drag him through the water and say, you know, we're going to go back to the bank. Try to, try to swim. You messed up. This is on you, Peter. No, what did he do? He just immediately lifted him up. Yes, he got his eyes right back on Jesus. So guess what? I can live my life without fear of failure. Yeah. Yeah. I can live my life. Yeah. Amen. I can live my life without fear of bankruptcy. I can live my life without fear that, that, I'm, that, that I, it's not going to work out for me. I can live my life now with an expectancy and a hope and a knowing that my future is assured. My Father is with me. He'll uphold me. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll never step back and say, well, let's see if you can do it on your own this time, big boy. He won't do any of that because my God is in me. And he, I mean, just like you love it when your children succeed and you love it when you can help your child and you want to see them do well and you want to see them do better. So much more is my father towards me and I have no fear. Uh, I have no fear, see. And what the Lord was telling me yesterday, don't shrink back. Don't, listen to this, don't let others invade your ground. What is he saying? Don't let others invade your ground in your thinking. Don't let them and what they say, see. You invade. Whew. You invade. You push out. You expand. The moment that we start saying, I can't, I can't, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I, I got fear, I don't. See, what you're doing is you're letting the enemy start to, in, you know, oh, I can't, I, I'll never be a financial success. Oh, I don't know, I don't know if, 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 if I'll ever be healed. Oh, you know, the doctor said, and so the doctor said, what the doctor says is more important than what God has said. And so, so the doctor, and so you let, and we let these voices start taking ground from us, taking things from us that God has already given us. How do you overcome that? Well, what you do is, is you first of all set yourself, draw a line in the sand and say, you will not take any more ground from me. I'm a child of the Most High God. I will not let. I will not let you. Because as long as you are apathetic and as long as you're passive and as long as you're okay with the condition of your life, what you're going to experience will give up a little bit because that's not a big deal. Oh, I can do without that. Oh, I can, I can deal with the ongoing headaches. Oh, I can deal with a little sinus infection. Oh, you know, it's springtime and, 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 and so and my allergies. You know, but that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is for the world, but that's not just the way it is for a child of God. But if you want it, then just have it. Well, no, I don't want it, Pastor, but you know. I do know. I know God. And Paul said... I know in whom I have believed. And yes, you can get righteously angry and say, I'm not giving 
ground up in my life. And then, and then what do you do from there? Then you just start, you say, no, I'm going to take ground. Areas in your life that have bothered you, you take that back. You take that back. You invade the enemy's territory. Don't, let, don't be in a defensive posture all your life. Don't be, well, I'm just, you know. We, Christians, Christians are so, I have got it so wrong. I'm just talking this morning. Is that okay? Man, I'm not hungry at all. I've got a whole nother. <laughs> Christians, Christians, got it so, Christians are so attack-minded. Listen to me. I've talked to people. I've counseled people. I, I, I get to do this all the time. And, and, and I get to hear, you know, Pastor, we've just been attacked one time. It's been one thing after another. One thing after another. We're just, we're just under attack all the time. I don't know what we're doing wrong. I don't know, you know, um, I'm sick. I've got to go to the hospital. This is happening with my kids, my finances, my job. And, and I mean, you know, it, I mean, you get this idea that they're just being beat down and beat down and beat down. And, and please come help me kind of mentality. Your perspective is wrong. Your thinking is wrong. You are in a defensive posture that is just trying to keep from ground being taken instead of being on an offensive posture saying, I am going to take ground. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Jesus was attacked all the time. Jesus could have said, today was a bad day. I preached a message and everybody got up and left. Jesus could have said, could have gone home one night, Peter and James and John, they're trying to kill me. They tried to throw me off a cliff yesterday. I shouldn't be attacked like this. I'm the son of God. Where have I missed it? You know, we laugh because, well, yeah, but that's Jesus. See, do you see how, how identity, how our identity is so messed up that we see him differently than we see ourselves? See? That, that we don't recognize that our union with him and that Christ is living through us and that he became us. You know, um, Jesus was on the ship going across to the other side and he's asleep. I mean, you know, when we have had a long day, what do we do? Get in the car, go to sleep, whatever it is, if we're driving somewhere. So Jesus is just doing what he normally would do. And a storm came. And a storm came and it looked like it was going to drown the whole ship. You can read this in, in Mark chapter 4. And so everybody around him was like, oh my gosh, we're going to die. We're going to die. Peter, we are going to die. I mean, and these are fishermen. They know, what, they know what a bad storm looks like. And they ain't never seen one quite like this. And we're going to die. And, and, and where's Jesus? And they go to the, to the back and, and he's asleep. We're going to die. Jesus is going to die. And look at him. He don't even care. That's what they said. And the more they talked about it, the angrier they got. And so finally they woke him up and said, I mean, it is so bored up, their first response to him was, Master, don't you care that we're about to die? They didn't even, they didn't even go, hey, can you wake up for a minute? we got a problem going on. Like, they, they had so gotten offended by this point that Jesus just wakes up, gets up and just rebukes the storm and says... Why don't you have any faith? I mean, what? The word was, go to the other side. Is there any question in your mind whether or not Jesus was going to get to the other side? No. So stuff was happening. Here's the secret. Listen. And, 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 and I, I, 
this thing on Isaiah 53, we're, we're going to have to dig really into it, but I really believe that this morning the Lord wants to deal with some things in your heart. Okay? So listen. You've got to change your mentality. And you've got to change your thinking concerning the things that go on around you. And you've got to stop looking at what's happening in your life. I'm ta- listen to me. I'm talking by the Spirit of God. You're going to have to stop looking at what's going on in your life and stop blaming everything that's happening in your life as an attack by the devil. You are, you are, you are attack-minded. You are defensive-minded. And so you are shrinking back from what God has promised you. And I'm going to tell you something. When Jesus showed up on this earth, he showed up as a king that was expanding the kingdom. And we have too many churches full of too many Christians that are just interested about their stuff and not losing their stuff and what's happening in their life when we should already come from a standpoint of recognizing we've already been blessed, we're already in the kingdom, we've got the king of kings on the inside of us and letting him live through us and nothing can happen to us. Death can no longer have any power over us. Satan has no power over me anymore. The curse has no power over me anymore. I am, I am Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise by the glory of God. Jesus was made a curse so that I wouldn't be cursed. Jesus was made a curse so that the blessing would be on my life, so that I would be surrounded by him. And so my faith in him releases the faith of him in my life. And You better stop wondering why things are happening to you and you better stop happening to the things. It doesn't matter. We spend our lives trying to figure things out. We're leaning to our own understanding. We're trying to figure it out. Why this? Why this? Why this? Jesus didn't get up and say, why did the storm come? Jesus took care of the storm. And I'm telling you, listen to me, you are kingdom citizens. There is a life for you that God has already deposited on the inside of you. Right now. Right now. Increase. Increase. An increase of the kingdom of God. An increase of the kingdom of God. An increase of the king in your life. An increase of his power. An increase of his glory. An increase of victory. An increase in... But it starts by what you see and what you believe on the inside of you first. The kingdom is on the inside of you and you better stop looking at every financial situation as if it's the devil's after my money again. Well, of course the devil's after your money. But the devil can't do nothing to your money unless you allow him to do something to your money. And so it's reflected in the way that you use your money and what you do with your money because you're so lack-minded. You're so I don't have enough-minded. And your language reflects what you believe in your heart. Well, I don't have enough to do this. I don't have enough to do this. I don't have enough to do this. Uh, You know, and I can't do this. And I can't, I can't. And we're negative, negative. And we're living just like the rest of the world instead of recognizing the, the spiritual reality of what God has already done for us and what God has already created for us. And I'm going to tell you, you'll never live the changed life until you believe your life is changed. Take an inventory this week. I'm giving you some homework. Take an inventory of your life. Take an inventory of the areas that you have felt like the devil has attacked you. Take an inventory of the areas that that you want to see things better in your life. And then when you take a look at that, I want you to start, I, I want you to get to the place you say no more. No more. And then what I want you to do with each one of those areas, I want you to see now, now what, what, does, what does a child of God, what does that look like in this situation? 
What does it look like for the king to reign through me with my kids? What does it look like for the king, for Jesus himself living through me? What does that look like for my marriage? What does that look like in my finances? One quick story, one example on the financial side. Jennifer and I, our whole life, and we've been married 29 years. Jennifer and I, for, for 29 years, never, uh, we, just, we just had enough money to make ends meet. Okay? Just, just barely enough. Never could save. Never could. Oh, we tried to save. We tried to save money, you know, because that's what you're supposed to do. And, and every time we, we, we got maybe $1,000 in the bank, something would break. Something would go wrong. We'd spend it on this. It's a new television that came out. I don't know, whatever it was. You know, but uh, we just never could. You know? and, and, and sometimes my income, we didn't know from one week to the other where, whether I was, where the money was coming from. We had to trust God. But it always seemed like it was just, uh, you know, we just never could get ahead. You ever felt like that? You just never could get ahead. And so as a result, even in my business, I had racked up um, uh, quite a bit of credit card debt. Okay? And, and so that credit card debt was sitting at about $40,000, $50,000 that, ne- that I'd never been able to get ahead on. Just make the minimum. Just make sure. Try to keep my credit good, that sort of thing. Never could get ahead on it. And, and, and so we had some investment uh, um, stuff that one day I thought it's going to it's going to it's be my windfall. It's going to, be, it's going to produce for me. I'm going to be able to pay everything off. And, and, and Jennifer had tried for years ju- you know, just to uh, tell me, say, look, why don't, you, why don't you just sell that, get out of it, and take the money, and let's pay down some of that credit card debt. Well, no, I'm not, you know, no. no. Well, see, here was, here was the deal. I wanted to hold on to it because I was afraid that if I let it go, I wouldn't have any money. I was afraid. See, I, we hold on to things, and we, you know, and, and, and so fear. So it wasn't that it, I, I was hopeful or wishful that maybe it would produce something in the future, but the real root of it was I couldn't let it go because the fear of letting it go was, was so powerful and, and, that, and, and the fear of not having enough because my, my life experience had set up in my mind that I, don't, I won't have enough. I won't be able to, or I won't be able to do this. Or I won't. And so she, she tried to get me for two years to do this. And, and so, uh, so, so as we begin to get, uh, again, uh, thank God we continue to grow in the Word and we continue to grow in these truths. As I begin to get a hold of this, this truth about being blessed, God has abounded towards me so that I can abound towards others. And I recognized that that was a stronghold in my life. I recognized that holding on to that investment was my security, was my, you know, what if, you know, what if the economy tanks? What if something goes bad? What if, well, at least I've got this to fall back on. And I recognized that I wouldn't let what was in my hand be used to take care of what was keeping me enslaved to that interest and to that debt. And I had to make a decision. I said, Lord, um, I'm going to trust you. I trust what your word says. I'm trusting you fully now in the name of Jesus. And you know what? It was, it was a scary proposition to, to sell that investment and to take that and then to apply it to credit cards that I had been enslaved to. This just happened last year. Okay, that I'd been enslaved to for probably 10 years or more, not able to ever get ahead, not able to ever get ahead, and say, no, we're going to take it. Father, I trust you, and I'm going to take, I'm, I'm going to act against this fear. I refuse to shrink back anymore. I refuse to be controlled by fear anymore. I refuse to let that define me anymore. I am taking this step, and I'm going to slash that and, and, and pay it off. Uh, I paid off probably thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of credit card debt. Thank God we had it to be able to do that with. Let me tell you something. I never connected the two. 
But about a month later, man, the Spirit of God on the inside of me, he told me, he says, he says, your days of lack are over. He said, you, you broke the cycle. You broke you, by letting, letting these things continue to impact my life. He said, he said you've, you've broken it. And you've now fully trusted me. And you know, from that day, I'm telling you what the Lord has done in our lives in supernatural ways, not through the church, but through other ways and other means, that what the Lord has done in our life, that we, you know, we have money saved for the first time in our life, we have, but it's, not, it's effortless. God has blessed us. But it's because I refuse to live my life holding on to things that I didn't need to hold on to anymore because I was afraid that I could never get it back I was afraid that it would never happen in my life again. I was afraid that was my security. See? So by taking the risk, and it's not a risk when you step by faith. We live a life of faith. That's why I love this church. That's why I love the name of this church. It is this able to learn to trust Him. And my faith in Him releases the faith of Him and allows Him to live through my life it was there all the time. It was available all the time. But see, my heart, my heart, out of my heart flow the issues of life. And my heart wanted to stay in fear. I don't care what you're saying. I don't care what you agree with up here. You know in your heart if there's fear there, whether you're trusting or not. And it's time for us to let go of the defensive posture and to become kingdom-minded kingdom I mean everywhere you go you're gaining ground everywhere you go you're expanding the kingdom everywhere you go that is who God created you to be amen stand with me please hallelujah thank you Lord father we just praise you we glorify you right now in Jesus name Lord I just give you praise just thank you right now for your love Thank you, like right now. Some of you, some of you that are here, you, you've, you've, allowed, you've allowed people to push into. You've allowed circumstances to push into your life. You've allowed, you, and, and, and you've allowed your experience and you've allowed your past to define the way that you think and the way that you believe. And I'm telling you, your experience will never lead you to victory. Let me say that again. Your experience is not what leads you to victory. It is the Word of God and understanding His Word and understanding who He is in you that will lead you into a place of experiencing His life. And so for you, it's just a decision. It's not, it's not trying to get you to do something to try to cause a change. It's you finally making a decision. I'm going to allow Jesus. I'm going to look to Him and allow Him to live His life through me. And you're looking to that. And you're looking to that. And you're looking to Him. And, and so when He says, come out onto the water, let some of those things go. Let the fear go. See, now as I'm looking to Him, it empowers me to step out. Why? Because He's actually living that through me. Oh, so good. So good. So good. Thank you, Father. Right now in the name of Jesus, I think some of you need to make some decisions this morning. You need to make some decisions this morning. Hallelujah. If you would, if, if this minister to you and you know that you've retreated and, and that there are some things that you need to push back on now, raise your hand. Let me just see right now. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. There's a change that starts right now. Father, right now in Jesus' name. Mm. I tell you what, let's do this. Just uh, pray this with me. Just say, Father, in the name of Jesus. I will not be defense-minded. I will not be attacked-minded. I will expand my capacity to believe. I will not let others invade me. But I will be the one to invade for your kingdom.
thank you, Father, for making me more than a conqueror. Thank you that the lion of the tribe of Judah lives on the inside of me. I thank you, Father, that my faith in Jesus releases the faith of Jesus to live through me. And so from this day forward, I will not shrink back. I will not retreat. I will not fear. I will not try to just protect myself. But I will step out boldly in full assurance of faith that you are with me, that you'll never let me fail, that you'll never let me fall. You're faithful. And Jesus, I look to you. You live through me. Your life, your faith, your power, your glory, your will, your desire for my life happens now. And from this day forward, forever, in Jesus' name. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo!